Hello, everybody, and welcome back to I Wish You Were Dead, a podcast about things that used to be alive. My name is Mike. That is Gavin. Gavin, I think we're on the clock today. We sure are, Mike. We are on a little bit of a time crunch here. Not really because of, you know, we actually have things to do. Let's be real. We don't have lives. But uh, we're going to do a little bit of a speed run type challenge today. We're going to be doing 600 million years of Earth history in 60 minutes, or at least trying our best. So certainly we're going to try our best. Now I have to ask you why 600 million years? Why are we picking 600 million years ago as our starting point for this episode? Uh, for a couple of reasons. Number one uh, is that it sounds good. Yes, correct. <laughs> um, but also, so about 600 million years is when we first start to see complex life uh, really starting to be a thing. So there is more than just an arbitrary reason for it other than just being like 660, you know? Understood. Understood. So that makes total sense. Before we get rocking on that, though, we do have to find out today's episode is coming out on the 27th. What's uh, What happened in science, in history on this day? Let's see. According to my little desktop calendar here, on January 27th, 2016, the headline Ooh. is, Alpha Go is the first AI to defeat a champion Go player. I don't know what, like Pokemon Go. I I have actually heard this about this. No, it's um, uh, it is some <laughs> sort of game. I I don't I don't know the game. I think chess, um, like in that sort of genre. Okay, but I don't actually know the game. So that I I think it explains it. Myself. I think it explains it in the little description here. So let's see. In a landmark event for pattern recognition software and autonomous learning algorithms. Google's artificial intelligence program, christened AlphaGo, flawlessly defeated European Go champion Fan Hui. Go, an ancient Chinese game long thought to be the ultimate test of AI reasoning, was previously the only major strategy board game that hadn't been quote-unquote solved by AI. Instead of being taught the game, AlphaGo came equipped with a general-purpose learning algorithm that it used to teach itself how to play and win. That is horrifying. Uh Exciting and horrifying and all of that all at once. And as I'm looking at a quick uh, version of the board here, the again, having neither played either game, my quick comparison to je- chess seemed like it. Uh, You've never it played chess? Sense. I have not. Uh, I've never played chess. What? I know it is something I've always been a little bit afraid to uh, to actually start learning myself. So maybe that'll be something I have to pick up. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm not good. <laughs> but I do enjoy chess. Uh, I do have actually. I have a chess tattoo. Fun fact. Um, really, I do. That was my second tattoo. Okay. Anywho, well, we'll have to get into that in a little bit. We are wasting some time now. We have six hundred million years to go. So everybody, let's get in the way back machine, as one of my favorite podcast stuff you should know would say, and let's head back to six hundred million years ago. Take it away. All right. So first, a little reminder of how we do time in geology. So we have eons are the biggest, then eras, then periods, and then epochs. So, And that's are, starting from the largest amount of time to smallest amount of time. Yes. So eons are the biggest, at least in Earth history. Um, and then era, period, epoch. So we are starting way back in the final period of the Proterozoic Eon called the Ediacaran which was roughly 632 to 541 million years ago, lasting for about 94 million years. So like I mentioned earlier, this is when sort of the first uh, really strong evidence of complex life shows up uh, called the Ediacaran biota. And we call it that because these animals are so incredibly weird that we can't even tell. We can tell like, okay, they're animals. But beyond that, you know, these don't really even resemble anything like we have today. And when you say complex life, I'm just curious, does that mean multi-celled organisms or how are we defining complex life? Uh, pretty much like multi-celled organisms, which does have like a specific definition. It's like cells working together to do things rather than just cells living together. So this would be like things even more simple than like sponges, which are like barely animals as it is. Understood. So the Ediacaran biota itself is from about 580 
to about 541 million years ago. And it happens like right after like a, a really short glaciation period. Um, and most people think that, you know, something with this glaciation probably like just dumped a bunch of like sediment and therefore nutrients into the, into the oceans. Cause obviously at this point life uh, has not left the oceans and that just like increase of sediments and nutrients just sort of kicked life into maximum overdrive. Another SpongeBob reference there. Um, <laughs> and, and st- kicked off, you know, a pretty big radiation uh, as we get into sort of the main, you know, the current eon that we are in, the Phanerozoic eon. Um, so most phyla probably diverse here, like animal phyla, which is like the second largest like uh, tier that we have. There's like kingdom, phylum. So phyla is plural of phylum. Um, they probably diverged here, but like we said, we don't really know because the animals that were around here are just so heckin' weird that... We're like, we think that these are separate things, but we don't even know what they are. Um, so animals that are like the most divergent, at least that we would think of today as being like the most different while still technically being animals, their common ancestor, you would say, most likely comes from this period of time. Probably. Um, the, and like I said, this is the first evidence, as with everything in paleontology, there probably was some thing that was like technically an animal around before this. But this is the first, like, really strong evidence that we have of it. Perfect. Okay, so this is where we have kind of that first evidence of animals. And what kind of happens, uh, how do we kind of get to the line of demarcation where we're ending this, uh, it was ending this epic and then going into the next? So this would be ending both the Ediacaran period as well as the Phanerozoic Eon. So this is ah. the end of an eon, which is pretty big. And it's basically just defined by, like, a significant increase in complex life. Um, also, it's, it's the breaking up of a supercontinent because there has been many of them, not just Pangaea. But this one was called uh, Panodia or Panotia. So there's been multiple, but just want to throw it out there. So a combination of complex life popping up as well as the breaking up of the supercontinent ends the uh, Proterozoic Eon and puts us into the Phanerozoic Eon that we are currently in, as well as the Cambrian Period. I feel like I've heard of Cambrian before. Go ahead. So the Cambrian period is the first period of the Phanerozoic Eon, like I said, as well as the first period of the Paleozoic era. So uh, the Cambrian lasted from about 541 million years ago to about uh, 485 million years ago. And the reason why you've probably heard about this is because uh, of a little event called the Cambrian explosion. That's the one. Basically, most like large scale groups, like we think that the, all of the different phyla diverged during the Ediacaran. We know for a fact that they were separate with, with like one exception that we don't see until the following period, all the phyla that we are aware of show up here. So massive, massive radiation of large scale groups that are still around today. Um, like I mentioned before, Nothing on land existed yet, like land plants did not exist yet. Uh, so all of the continents were super like barren, rocky, and the only soil that they really had was like super thin, and it was only formed by like bacteria and different microbes. No plants on land yet, or anything on land really. So anything that most of us would recognize as, as life during the uh, the Cambrian era is in the water, correct? W- absolutely, and it will stay there for a few hundred million years. Um <laughs> So at this point, so I'm also going to be going through and sort of talking about just like world conditions, not just like life things, because, you know, I'm also a geologist. So conditions of the rest of the planet are important, too, because that really influences how life does. So at this point, there is no ice on the planet at all. Um, Really? Until maybe toward the end, you might get a little bit. Um, There's a little bit of evidence for some glaciations at the end, but other than that, there's really no ice on the planet. And because there's basically no plants, I mean, there are plants, but not like, you know, trees, grass, you know, any land plants. It only had about 63% of the modern oxygen in the atmosphere. 
We're not going to have time to talk about it today, but I definitely want to have a uh, an episode on the formation of kind of the polar ice caps and ice on the planet Earth and kind of what that's meant for for the different kinds of life that have existed there. But we can just kind of mark that down as a note and uh, yeah. and move on, I suppose. Yeah. I mean, like there's been ice and no ice several times, uh, you know, in between. But anyway, so along with having less oxygen in the atmosphere, there was really high carbon dioxide. Uh, there was about 16 times the carbon dioxide and it's usually measured and, and compared to like uh, pre-industrial numbers before humans, you know, screwed everything up. So, but 16 times pre-industrial levels, like so much CO2 in the atmosphere. And it was about seven degrees Celsius hotter than it is today on average. And sea levels, super, super high, uh, up to like 90 meters above where the oceans are today. Which is and crazy. just for some context, for seven degrees Celsius, correct me if I'm wrong, but most climate scientists are warning of an increase of about like one, two, possibly three degrees Celsius being catastrophic for you know, life as we know it today. And, you know, back then the average was seven degrees hotter than today. Well, it's not necessarily with climate change. It's not about the magnitude. It's about the rate. So it's like if you increase by two degrees Celsius over a couple million years, not that big of an issue. If you do it over a few hundred, that is a massive issue. Right, right. So that that's just for context that it, that it was generally pretty hot, you know, but that doesn't mean like the world was ending at this point. In fact, the world, you know, life on it anyway, was just sort of beginning, you know? So uh, like I said, most phyla were observable by the end of this period. This was the first time we get mineralized skeletons which the Ediacaran biota did not have. They were all like, uh, they didn't have any hard parts. So this is when you get things like shells, uh, exoskeletons on arthropods, you know, things like, uh, you know, crabs, lobsters, uh, insects. Obviously none of those groups were around at this point, but things with exoskeletons, there were no real bones yet in vertebrates. Um, verte Actually, I don't believe vertebrates were around. Uh, our bigger group that we belong to called chordates were around by the end of the Cambrian, uh, but they didn't really have bones, uh, nor did they have jaws, which we'll talk about in a bit. Just really quickly. So the, you mentioned at the end of the last period of time that we were talking about whose name I have already forgotten how, and we don't even, the, uh, the Edicardian? Ediacaran. How do you say that? Ediacaran, yeah, the Ediacaran. Um, you mentioned how animals just would not, be familiar to us today like it's all you know it's almost like especially if you're a lay person looking at them you would have no idea if i was to look at animals during the cambrian would i recognize them as animals or would it still be so foreign to me as to be you know something else most of them most of them i, th I think you would you'd be like i have no idea what that is but you'd probably be like if someone asked you is this an animal you'd probably be like probably okay um but let's see so there was an extreme increase in both biodiversity and uh, disparity. So it's not like there was just a bunch of different things that were really similar. Things were starting to like really, really diverge both like in relatedness and also in like their shape and their function, which was the first time that this had really happened. You know, mostly Ediacaran stuff is like soft and squishy and did mostly the same thing and looked kind of similar. But this is when we get, you know, you know, everything from clams to like, uh, shrimp like things lots of just different things around which was the first time that had that had really happened and then this is also the start of uh something called bioturbation which is essentially when things are sort of burrowing around in the soil which might not seem like that big of a deal to us who are used to it but back then th that had never happened before so it really mucks up good rock records because now there's things moving around in the sand in the soil um you know, sort of preventing it from being deposited in the nice layers that geologists really like. Hmm. And this period, you know, sets up the next 500 million years of life. So thanks, Cambrian. So so we are one-sixth of the way home. Oh, God. Speed mode. Okay, next we have the Ordovician. So, Ordovician period. From the uh, about 800 and... Or, sorry. <laughs> wow, 800. Too fast. 
485 million years ago to about 443 million years ago, lasting about 41 and a half million years. Uh, a little more oxygen than the Cambrian, uh, about 68% of modern oxygen, a little less CO2 than the Cambrian, only about 15 times pre-industrial, and a little bit colder, uh, only about two degrees above modern. However, the sea levels were way high, up to around 220 meters above current sea levels. I don't even know what that would look like. Uh, <laughs> I'm curious to how that would have happened. Um, just various things like, uh, maybe there wasn't a lot of like volcanic stuff going on or, or continent building events going on. So there was just a lot more erosion than there was like uplift. That's a potential reason. Um, and this is like an average throughout the entire period, you know? Mm -hmm. So following sort of on the heels of the Cambrian explosion, there was also a really, really big, uh, you know, diversification event at the beginning of the Ordovician as well, which in like magnitude is bigger uh, than the one in the Cambrian, but be the Cambrian one gets more attention just because it's like the first one. <laughs> and overall, about 12% of all Paleozoic, which is this era, 12% um, of all Paleozoic marine animals are from this time, considering that that's out of about 300 million years worth of time. 12% is massive. Right. That seems like it's a, a, you know, a nice chunk of, you can make a career out of studying, you know, even just a partial segment of that amount of, you know, marine animals. Absolutely. So, and it's not just like getting more diverse. It's also getting a little more recognizable for at least, you know, ocean things. Uh, you know, clams are around cephalopods, which are things like uh, squids, octopi, nautiluses, None of those specific groups were around, but that's the, the group of animals that they all belong to. So cephalopods were around, snails and, and their relatives were around, and in general, really, really diverse. But something else that's really important is that the ocean floors get like tiered, which had never really been a thing before. So it's, it's not just like things sort of on the sediment and then maybe a little underneath it. Now there was things like pretty deep in, in the sediment, so medium in the sediment, shallow in the sediment on the sediment and then stuff above the water column too, which, you know, that's just extra niches for different organisms to fill. And, and I imagine it makes it a lot easier to just tell when, you know, when things died, kind of where, where to put them in, in the whole, you know, timeline of everything. Yes and no, because of that increase in bioturbation. So because, ah, yes, yes, yes. Bioturbation. Yes. So again, just that mucking up and, and remixing of the soil. But that sort of adds to that because now there are things in the soil that are there to die for the other things in the soil to eat. So that's just sort of like a positive feedback loop, you know? Mm -hmm. And for the first time, we get real fish. And by the, <laughs> by the end of the Ordovician, we have jaws, which, as I mentioned uh, in one of our previous episodes about uh, vertebrates and uh, just sort of dispelling some misconceptions about vertebrates, you know, vertebrates getting jaws it was probably the single biggest event in vertebrate evolutionary history. Really? Oh, yeah. Like, well, because think about it. Just eating becomes way easier if you have jaws. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, obviously, they had mouths beforehand, but it really changes up what you can do. Because up until this point, they were just sort of like... They would just eat whatever was uh, in front of them. They, they, the fish that were around before Jaws had mouths almost sort of like a shark where it's like on the bottom of their head instead of like in the front, like most modern fish are. So they would basically just be swimming along the sediment and would just sort of suck up like a whole clam or something and just swallow it whole. Whereas if you have Jaws, you can actually manipulate your food a little bit and be a little choosier about what it is that you're eating. So it just gives you a bit more of an advantage. Makes sense. And, you know, speaking of by the end, you know, when fish got jaws, we have our first mass extinction. Wonderful. So mass extinctions in general are way more complicated than we have time to get into here as we sort of alluded Future to. Future episode our, idea. Yes. Uh, I sort of alluded to that in our dinosaurs episode when we were talking about their extinction. But every mass extinction is... Well, maybe with one exception, uh, 
are way more complicated than anybody thinks. And it's not the dinosaurs one. That's, that's not complicated. <laughs> um, <laughs> but overall, the end or division mass extinction was the second largest in the terms of like the percentage of species that went extinct, like around 80% of all species went extinct at the end of the Ordovician. Wow. Which is massive. Um, and only about 50, about 50, 55% of genera, you know, like the, the plural of genus. So a lot of things died. What we think happened was that some volcanoes earlier in the period uh, deposited some rocks with lots of silica or basically quartz in them. Uh, and when, when rocks with lots of silica in them weather, they absorb CO2 from the atmosphere. Uh, and also land plants started showing up, not like super large ones, but they were around sort of toward the end of the Ordovician. Uh, and they also sucked up some CO2. And when that happens, uh, you know, sort of the opposite of a greenhouse effect. If you have lots of CO2 in the atmosphere, it gets warm. If you take a bunch of it out, it gets cold. So there were some glaciations at the end of the Ordovician that happened really quickly. And that's probably what caused it. Although, like I said, way more complicated. I'm almost positive that's not the only cause. I have lots of questions, but we do need to get rocking and rolling. We have <laughs> reached about the end of the Ordovician period, which was about 443 or so million years ago. And it's bringing us to another period of time that I can't pronounce. So that is the Silurian or a Silurian, depending on who you ask. But that this period goes from around 443 million years ago to about 419 million years ago, lasting roughly 25-ish million years. Uh, once again, getting more oxygen in the atmosphere, about 70% of modern oxygen levels. Uh, on average, about back up to 16 times pre-industrial CO2 levels, and about 3 degrees above uh, modern temperatures, and about 180 meters sea level uh, above uh, above today. And there were a few spots during some glaciations that went below modern levels. Where, so sea levels were lower than they are now. Mm. Honestly, the Silurian's kind of weird. Be partially because it's very short and partially because there was a mass extinction at the beginning of it. We just don't have a lot of rocks from this time. At least like fossil bearing rocks. Uh, but is this because there's just they, not many of them exist or because it's not studied well? Probably a bit of both. I think it's probably not studied all that well because there are not that many rocks from this time. Makes sense. A little bit of a chicken and egg. Yeah, exactly. But there are some really important things that happened here. So fun fact for uh, Mike and I, we're both from like the central New York area. Uh, one of the larger cities in central New York is Syracuse, which has the nickname the Salt City. <laughs> yeah. And this is this is when uh, all of Syracuse's salt was deposited. So fun fact. Uh, for the first time, we have like actually recognizable land plants. Like, granted, it is not like big trees. It is not, you know, grasses or anything that you would, you know, say, oh, I know what kind of plant that is. But as at least things on land that you would look at that and be like, it is a plant of some form. So the Silurian is famous for being able to give us plants. It's not famous for much, but we finally have some life that is growing, what would we say, above the surface or still yep. in the water? Uh, so by this point, um, they were in like tidal type areas because at this point seeds hadn't evolved yet. So they still needed water to be able to reproduce with spores. So these, these, are, some, these are some animals like or animals, some plants similar to like ferns and mosses. But back in the water, we have our first Osteichthians, which, hmm. as Mike should know from the vertebrates episode, are bony fish. Very bony. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, we also have Eurypterids, a really cool group of uh, invertebrates that are called sea scorpions. Uh, it's also New York State fossil. New York State has an official fossil? It sure does. <laughs> that, that's most, why I wanted to make this podcast. Most states do. Um <laughs> But ours is a cool little sea scorpion guy. Uh, so what else is going on in the ocean? So corals have sort of been around since the Cambrian, but we think that they got their endosymbiotes during the Silurian, which is what allows them to do photosynthesis. Um, the corals themselves don't do, but it's like a, a protist, a single-celled organism that lives inside their tissues that does photosynthesis and gives the coral food. Uh, and by the end, we have the first land animals. 
mostly arthropods. Wow. Actually, I, th I think at this point, exclusively arthropods. Uh, no vertebrates yet. But things like myriapods, which are your centipedes, um, millipedes, things like that. Arachnoids, not quite arachnids. So spider relatives, not quite spiders. And some others uh, around that. And honestly, the Silurian ends pretty uneventfully, not going to lie. It ends uneventfully, and we march on as we continue to move faster and faster through time into <laughs> the D1. Yes, the D1. The Devonian from about 419 million years ago to about 358 million years ago, lasting roughly 60 million years. More oxygen, you know, 75% modern. Less CO2 now, though, only about eight times uh, pre-industrial CO2. Six degrees above modern temperatures, uh, over, or, you know, 190 meters sea level uh, above us. Eventually, by the end, falls to about 120 meters above current sea levels. Life goes absolutely nuts during the Devonian. Uh, we have Let's hear the highlights. We have massive, massive coral reefs, like easily dwarfing the Great Barrier Reef, Barrier Reef in Australia, easily. We actually have some big fishes. Uh, those Osseichthians are getting more diverse. Uh, we have true chondrichthians, you know, sharks and rays, things like that. And then a really cool group of uh, fish called placoderms, which I love them. They're one of my favorite groups of animals. They have like armor on their front half, just exposed bone on their front half. Uh, really weird, really big, really important group. Wish we had more really time cool to talk name. about them. Yeah. Uh, wish we had more time to talk about them, but moving on. Arthropods continue to be super dominant on land, pretty much because they're the only animals there at the time. Uh, we get actual insects for the first time here. So true like bugs, things with six legs, three body segments, antennae, uh, wings, actually. And our great times like 20 million grandparents, a.k.a. the tetrapods, the first vertebrates to go on land during the Devonian. Woo! Shout out for grandpa. And land plants also go pretty crazy. We had our first sort of quote unquote trees. They're not quite trees, but they have a structure that lets them be up off the ground, which has had not happened before at this point. So basically trees. Okay. And then just when life is going pretty well, mass extinction number two. Bring it down. We need a sound effect for that. I wish I had one. <laughs> yeah, you can put it in post. <laughs> so this is the only uh, mass extinction that happens in the middle of a period, not at the end. So this is the late Devonian mass extinction. Uh, sometimes it's called the FF boundary for the two like epics that it falls between within the Devonian. Um, this one was kind of weird in that it, it occurred in pulses, depending uh, that range from like depending on who you ask, because this is one that we really don't know all that much about. Uh, but between like three million years and twenty five million years. Depends on who you ask, but it, it didn't all happen at once in one like big sudden event. Generally considered like pretty bad, you know, second or third, again, depending on who you ask in terms of like diversity lost. But when, in terms of like ecologically what happened, not all that bad. Um, you know, most groups still had members to continue on doing whatever that group does. So not really all that bad. And it really seems to only have been super bad in the ocean. Doesn't seem to be that big of an effect on the things that were currently on land. Uh, things like brachiopods, which were, they look a lot like clams and did similar things to clams, but are not clams. Uh, they were hit pretty hard. Trilobites were hit really hard. Reefs were almost completely extinct from this wow. extinction. Yeah. Uh, the, the causes are really, really hotly debated because like I said, we don't know. But what we do know is that it could have been some really rapid cooling, some, you know, ocean volcanoes kicking up a bunch of gases and stuff into the ocean, really rapid sea level changes. Cause like I said, there was like a 70 meter swing throughout, you know, the period and low ocean oxygen is also another thought. Sometimes that, sometimes that just happens due to various like geochemical things. We don't really know. And in fact, it might actually be like a decrease in speciation rates, like the like evolution of new species instead of an increase of extinctions. That can be really hard to tell in the fossil record. We don't think that that's the case, but it's possible. And then throughout the rest of the Devonian, not much else happens because a lot of things died. So we're moving on to the next period. <laughs> All right. 
So we're moving on to the Carboniferous period. Ranging I from, see carbon in there. Does that have anything to do with it? It absolutely does. So Carboniferous Sweet. means coal bearing. And as we'll talk about, this is when not all, but a very large chunk of the world's coal comes from. And we'll talk about why. So this period ranges from about 500 and 500, 358 million years ago to about 298 million years ago, about 60 million Under years. Under 300 years left to go. All right. Yeah, we're, we're getting there. Uh, we are at roughly 162% modern oxygen, a massive, massive spike in oxygen during the Carboniferous. Um, only about three times pre-industrial carbon dioxide levels, so we're getting less and less carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which is a good thing. Roughly the same temperatures as today, but sea level is super high, uh, you know, about 120 meters above today. And then by the end, uh, they fall down to about 80 meters uh, above, but these are averages, you know, across the entire period. Like I said, lots and lots of coal for a reason that we'll talk about that actually led to the end of this period. Amphibians are doing super, super well. This is when, you know, amphibians, but not lis amphibians, which we talked about in our vertebrates episode, they're doing really well because it's it's a relatively warm, humid climate. Um, they're doing good things. Amniotes with real shelled eggs show up here for the first time. So again, great times, several million uh, grandparents. And then <laughs> when things are all just nice and groovy, one of the coolest things in Earth history happens, in my opinion. Land plants, like, explode in not just, like, diversity, but abundance. And this is why, they're, like, this is the highest oxygen levels that Earth has ever seen. By a lot. And it's because all those plants were taking in the CO2 and expelling oxygen, correct? Exactly. And because of that, lots of weird things happen. So... I have to explain a little bit of biology here, but it's really cool. So if you ever see stuff about like really giant bugs, you know, three plus foot long dragonflies, 10 foot long centipedes, that was from this time because, uh, you know, arthropods don't breathe with like lungs like we do. They have holes in their shells that just directly lets air flow into their tissues. And so their tissues just get direct oxygen from the air that way. And with such high oxygen levels that allowed them to get big because one of the big reasons why, uh, you know, insects, things like that are not that big today is because lower oxygen means that, you know, uh, if they were really big, that the air would have to go further into their body, which like leaves them vulnerable, leaves them, you know, more susceptible to like drying out. So huge, huge, huge bugs during this time. So if you are like arachnophobic, I'm really sorry. There were like, <laughs> Large to medium-sized dog spiders <laughs> during this time. Um, dragonflies with, like, around three-foot wingspans. Like I said, crazy, crazy time. You're not kidding. However, all these plants cause something else to happen, too. Uh, which is major glaciers, because as we talked about in the Devonian, uh, or, or the Ord Ordovician, when there's a lot of stuff sucking up CO2, it gets pretty cold. So all these plants sucked up a bunch of CO2 from the atmosphere and stored it in the ground when they died, meaning less CO2 in the atmosphere, meaning it got cold. Glaciers caused uh, a, a pretty minor extinction event, mostly just for the plants, called the Carboniferous Rainforest Collapse. Oh no, that sounds awful. Yeah. And weirdly, bacteria and fungi that break down wood and plant matter had not yet evolved until toward the end of this time. So all of these dead trees and stuff just kept piling up on each other and compressing each other. And that's why we have all of this coal. Oh yeah. So tetra tetrapods kept doing their thing. Um, they, they hung on through the rainforest collapse and the diapsids and synapsids split here. So that'd be the reptile lineage and the mammal lineage split uh, toward the end of this time. And also, Pangea starts to form here. Everyone's favorite supercontinent. <laughs> it's certainly the one that I know. And so with those glaciations, that brings us into the next period, the Permian. So anybody who knows a little bit about Earth history knows how this one ends. You're going to have to teach me. <laughs> the Permian 
goes from 298 million years ago to 251 million years ago, lasting 47 million years. This is the last period of the Paleozoic era, which is the longest and lasted about 289 million years. So about half of, you know, the history that we're talking about today. Uh, Higher oxygen than modern, about 115%. A little more CO2 than in the Carboniferous, about three times pre-industrial averages. A little bit warmer, like two degrees. And then sea levels are a little weird. It's only about 60 meters above today, but then at the end, goes down to like 20 below where we're at right now. So lots of weird variations going on here. Pangaea is in full swing. This is when Pangaea is like at its height. Lots and lots of stuff going on uh, in the oceans, you know, marine nearshore environments, you know, clo- you know, like from a reef to the shore, that whole area, super, super diverse. Um, mo- it's the most diverse it has been to this point, and it is at the most diverse that it will ever be. Incredibly really? great, incredibly great time. Well, at least at the beginning to be uh, living in a nearshore environment. Tetrapods really starting to figure out life and getting diverse and actually pretty big, you know, things uh, such as, you know, you know, getting roughly like cow sized on land, which on land is the largest things had ever been to this point. Uh, our ancient ancestors, uh, our being mammals, uh, ancient ancestors called therapsids were the most successful group, uh, especially toward the end. They were sort of like filled most niches, you know, herbivore, carnivore. Um, they, the only place that they weren't was like flying and in the oceans, they did lots and lots of different things and were super important. Uh, amphibians not doing awesome right now though, probably due to drier climates, uh, and you know, amniotes being generally better at doing things. So they had actual competition now. And then archosaurs show up toward the end, which archosaurs, uh, are the group of animals that like dinosaurs, crocodilians belong to. So now the therapsids had some competition of their own. Uh, like I mentioned, uh, in, in the nearshore stuff, ecological tiering was at the highest it will ever be. Lots of stuff, doing lots of different things in lots of different places in the water column and in the sediment column. Super diverse times. And then, as it always seems to be, when everything's all hunky-dory... People die. Literally everything died. So, not people, but, you know, other stuff. Almost, like, it is not an exaggeration to say that life almost ended here. Because we have the Permo-Triassic extinction, also called the Great Dying. That sounds exciting. So there was probably a little bit of a smaller extinction about 15 million years before this. But this is the big one that gets all the attention. There was a gigantic event of volcanism in what is now Russia called the Siberian Traps. There was roughly 100 million cubic miles of lava in an area of about 3 million square miles. Jeez. Now, to to put that in context, because this that sounds obviously really big, but who actually knows how much 3 million square miles is? Um, That is only slightly smaller than the entire lower 48 United States. (laughs) Oh, my God. Gosh. So imagine the the entire lower 48 United States covered in lava for about 2 million years. I can see why they call this thing this time the Great Dying. I don't see a whole lot of organisms that'd be able to survive that. Yeah. So this created, obviously, an enormous amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. The oceans became acidic because, you know... Uh, carbon dioxide in water, if you get a lot of it in water, it becomes uh, carbonic acid, which obviously is not awesome for things that make their shells out of things like calcium carbonate, which is most things that make shells because calcium carbonate dissolves in acid. So the oceans were so acidic, it was literally dissolving the shells off of things like clams Jesus. and corals. It was l- like, it wasn't just killing the corals. It was dissolving the reefs. Good gosh. The greenhouse effect became so extreme that uh, estimates of temperatures at the equator, and this is water temperatures, not land, were over 104 degrees. Fahrenheit? Yes. 
God, Celsius, oh my God, that would be unbearable. Like, literally nothing would have survived. <laughs> but for comparison, the highest sea temperatures that we have today are about 90 degrees. You know, 90 to 104 might not seem like a lot, but it takes a lot to change a water temperature. Like water has a really, really resists, uh, you know, a change in temperature, but also sea temperatures because that is an enormous volume of water to have to heat up. As anybody who has a pool heater will know. Yeah. And so it's estimated that about 70%, 70 percent of all terrestrial life went extinct and about 96 percent of all marine life went extinct and so at the end of this uh the great dying period i know we're going into another period of time and i have to tell you gavin we've got about four pages of notes left to go i think that we can <laughs> i think we can power through it if you want to power through it if we really try and go fast or do we want to call it here that this is going to have to be a part two to this episode how do you want to try and make this happen well i tried my best. <laughs> 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 um try tried to I, i've never been all that good at speed no you haven't um so how about this we will get to we'll we'll finish up the we'll do two more periods how about that? i'm all in for that we'll we'll leave the people wanting because we'll start the next one with the cretaceous period the one that everyone wants to hear about okay getting some uh, cliffhangers in there yeah so after the permian we have the Triassic period, the first period in the Mesozoic era, which most people know as the age of dinosaurs. After the disaster that was the end of Permian mass extinction, there was only about 80% of modern oxygen levels, six times um, pre-industrial CO2 levels, only about three degrees above modern though, because it got kind of cooler toward the end. And life was pretty bleak for the first like 10 to 15 million years. Uh, out of the Triassic period lasting roughly 50 million years. And after that, life got kind of interesting, though, after its uh, little recovery period. So lots of weird plants, at least for the time. Now we would see them be like, oh, yeah, things like uh, cycads, which are sort of the ancestors to like palm trees. They're still around, not nearly as, as numerous as they used to be, though. Ginkgos, which is a really uh, interesting like type of tree. Really weird type of plant. We have the first conifer trees. Most, like, easily recognizable. You would look at that and be like, oh, that's a conifer. Yeah. And ferns are also really, really prominent. Because, oh yeah, grass doesn't exist yet. Like, something as simple. Something as simple as grass. That just permeates through everything. You know, that, like, you know, I couldn't imagine, you know, life without grass. It's, you know, like the air at this point, And yet it just doesn't exist. Nope, it, it just straight up does not exist, and at this point would not for at least another, like, 150 million years. Wow. Marine biodiversity kind of bounces back by the end. Obviously, you know, like I said, in the Permian, that's at, like, its all-time high. So, like, it, it still, to this day, never gets to the point that it was at during the Permian, but it kind of comes back. Modern corals kind of show up during this time, build reefs uh, like they do today. And then uh, a group that some people might be familiar with, uh, the ammonites, the swirly-shelled squid guys, mm -hmm. That's this is when they first show up, and they go nuts. They get super, super diverse and are really, really important in uh, ocean ecosystems. Along with them in the oceans, we have the first marine reptiles, such as things like ichthyosaurs, which were sort of the first one and the most aquatically adapted of all the marine reptiles that we ended up get, that we end up getting throughout uh, history, we have the earliest plesiosaurs, which are like the Loch Ness monster looking guys, and some other like lesser known groups that aren't around for super long. You you tend to see like after big mass extinctions, life gets kind of janky for a while. Are you trying to restart itself out? Yeah, there's just some like weird animals that show up, try to do new things, and then life's just like nah get out of here <laughs> <laughs> yeah like i said weird animals were just kind of everywhere uh include include including like giant croc like amphibians not crocs yet <laughs> but they're amphibians but like the size of crocs really big really weird uh we had terrestrial relatives of actual crocs being like the main predators 
because that uh, the end Permian extinction really did a number on uh, our ancestors, the synapsids and therapsids. And, uh, you know, they were still around. They were still pretty important, particularly like the middle of the Triassic. But by the end, the archosaurs, which, like I said, like crocodilians are a member, they really took over and just started just kicking the synapsids out of being top tier predators, things like that. Oh, yeah. And then casually, it also rained for like two million years straight. (laughs) Yeah, like that's just a fun thing that I wanted to mention. Uh, it's called the Carnian Pluvial Event, if you wanted to look it up. Now, when we're, really talking, weird about, time. When we're talking about rain, like, is this raining water like we would normally see today? Oh, yeah, or, just, okay. Yeah, just raining water for like two million years. <laughs> Casual. And then around halfway through the Triassic. Here we go. We get, we get the dinosaurs. Yes! Why are we whispering? I don't know. I didn't want to alert all the Jurassic Park people. <laughs> <laughs> but we get some dinosaurs Anyways. once again that we get to talk about. Yeah, they're they're not super like ecologically important. Like they're around, but their their cousins, the other like archosaurs, the more croc like ones, are much more like ecologically important. But they're around, uh, starting at about two hundred and twenty five ish million years ago. When you say and dinosaurs are not important, do you mean they're not important right now, or do you mean like they just weren't important ecologically? Uh, at this point, okay, okay, okay. okay. In, in in the Triassic, like ecologically, they're just not super abundant. They're they're just not like the main players at this point. Gotcha. Uh, the first like big split in dinosaurs happens here with the two main groups, uh, the Saurischians and the Ornithischians. Uh, if you remember back to our dinosaur episode, I sort of explain what those mean. Pterosaurs also evolve here. They're not dinosaurs; they split off before dinosaurs. But the first flying vertebrates. Pretty neat. Mm-hmm. Uh, the very first true mammals show up here because before they were just sort of like mammal-like things. We have real, real-life mammals here. Pangaea starts to break up into two smaller but still super big continents, and then once again, just when life's getting pretty groovy, another mass extinction. I'm noticing a thing. Yes, the end Triassic extinction really kicking life while it's down. <laughs> And honestly, it's just kind of like a light version of the end Permian extinction. Uh, reefs hit really hard again. Seeing a bit of a theme here in that like whenever life gets crazy, reefs are like the first thing to go. Uh, certain plant groups hit really, really hard. Others, not so much. More or less turned the oceans into what we sort of see today, at least with like the groups present. With the exception of those ammonites, they get super, super common and are not really affected by this extinction all that much. We don't really have a great rec- record of, like, what happened on land. Like, we know certain things about it, but compared to, like, what how it affected the oceans, we don't really have a great record. Hmm. Uh, but what we do know, though, is that basically the only terrestrial groups that made it, at least uh, for, like, tetrapods, were crocodilian relatives pterosaurs, dinosaurs, and mammals. Some groups make it, but don't do super well. Those are like the f- only four groups that like do super well right after this. Some amphibian groups make it, but like I said, they haven't been doing all that well for quite a while at this point. Uh, some lizard snake relatives make it too, but don't do really well until like the late Jurassic, early Cretaceous, you know, for another, you know, several dozen million years from now likely caused by Pangaea breaking up and like as those continents were moving apart it just brought up a bunch of uh, magma from like the earth's core and like I said sort of similar to the Siberian traps that caused the end Permian but smaller so similar effects you know mm-hmm. slightly slightly better outcomes depending on who you ask this is one is like one of the worst you know potentially the second worst or somewhere in the middle I think most people kind of agree it's somewhere in the middle and this has to be kind of one of the most studied periods of time, you know, throughout all of archaeology and uh, paleontology, right? Well, not archaeology, because yeah, right, right, we yes, study people. Yes, right. Paleo- <laughs> I was hoping that I was able to get through Yes, paleontology. Yeah, no, you'll never get that far. <laughs> yes, I might, but I imagine this has to be one of the more studied periods of time, you know, kind of through all out of, you know, paleontology and geology. Yeah, yeah, it really is. Um, just because there's a lot of rocks from this, you know, especially in like Central Europe. There's a lot of Triassic rocks. Mm-hmm. Um, not that many Triassic rocks in like North America. 
There are some down in like Texas, uh, some up north in like Newfoundland, up in Canada. But in lots of other parts of the world, there's there's pretty good records of, of this stuff. Gotcha, gotcha. And so I think this Plus leads it's us, the start of the dinosaurs. I was going to say, so this kind of leads us into, I think, the last period we're going to be able to cover on this episode. So it looks like we're going to be able to do, what is that? 450-ish million years in 60 minutes instead of 600? Yeah, but it's like mostly interesting stuff happens after right now. <laughs> <laughs> this is the prequel episode. Like, I might be a, I might be a little biased because I study the time after the dinosaurs. So like maybe I'm a little biased, but well, Hey, let's cover the dinosaurs and then everybody uh, can just be well aware that we're going to get to all the good stuff. (laughs) We have the Jurassic period now Yes. from a 201 million years ago to 145 million years ago, lasting roughly 56 million years. High oxygen, about 130% of modern. Pretty high CO2, though, about seven times pre-industrial, uh, and about three degrees above modern temperatures. TBH, kind of boring. That's literally what I have in my notes. <laughs> Not a lot Can't happens confirm. during the Jurassic. Not a lot happens. Um, there's a lot of neat stuff around, though. Like, there's just not a lot of, like, interesting events that happen. Um, there were gigantic forests of conifer trees. Um, and prairies made out of ferns because at this point, still grass does not exist yet. (laughs) And also plants, plants with flowers don't exist yet, which today are, I don't want to say like the majority, but a very, very large portion of the plants that are around today are flowering plants. Mm -hmm. So some major, major groups of plants didn't exist yet, but we had these gigantic, like basically redwood forests, which is super cool. And this is when dinosaurs start to get big. And I mean big both as in like important and big as in just huge. So this is like the best time out of uh, all the time dinosaurs were around for the sauropod dinosaurs. You know, the, you know, the biggest ones of all time, you know, long neck, long tail dinosaurs. Stegosaurs, you know, like Stegosaurus, Mm -hmm. they go extinct at the end of the Jurassic. So this is sort of when they're at their best. And then we also get some larger theropod dinosaurs, you know, the two-legged meat-eating ones, uh, like Allosaurus, is really notable from this time period. Pterosaurs, still the main flying group. However, now they are not alone, because we now have the very first birds. Sweet. And and yeah, so we actually live closer in time to T-Rex than T-Rex lived in time to Archaeopteryx. Fun fact. <laughs> that that kind of by fun a good fact, chunk. That kind of fun fact always just blows by, my mind. Yeah, right. And it's it's by a pretty solid chunk of time too. Like it's it's not even close. So there were also some Therian mammals around now, which are, uh, you know, uh, more closely related to us. It is basically placental mammals. Those two terms aren't quite the same, but for our purposes, those are the same. Um, they're mostly like. Sort of like rodents, but not technically rodents. Uh, but some of them were like really well adapted. Like we had a couple like gliding forms and like some like small like aquatic forms, which were kind of interesting. So it's not like they were just chilling, doing nothing. Like they were still doing their own things. Mm-hmm. Uh, crocodilian cousins, uh, for the most part, were terrestrial up until this point, but they start to be aquatic like we know them today. And we have our first modern Lys amphibians, which are, you know, things like frogs, salamanders. They show up in the middle of the Jurassic. We have our first turtles, which I think I kind of alluded to in that vertebrates episode. We don't know where. We have no idea what they came from, but they're, they show up here. <laughs> the first squamates, which are lizards and snakes, show up here as well as some of their closer relatives. The Loch Ness Monster guys, the plesiosaurs, increase in diversity a lot here. But ichthyosaurs, the other marine reptile group, were pretty much just constantly declining after the Antriassic extinction. They never really recovered from that. And fish are really just living their best life. Fish are doing great right now. Uh, Teleosts, which are the most common group of fish today, they first show up at the end of the Triassic and then start doing super well by the end of the Jurassic. Lungfish are really common in freshwater and brackish uh, environments. Sharks just kind of doing... You know, their shark thing. Most groups of modern sharks are around by the late Jurassic. Is there a particular reason? Groups. Is there a particular reason why 
all these different fish were doing well during this period of time? Or was it just kind of happenstance that, yeah, this is, you know, a good time for them? I don't know. Off the top of my head, I would guess that there were probably some things that like went extinct at the end of the Triassic that was like competing with them. But now they're not there. So they're just like, hey, I'm going to do better now. Okay. More or less. Obviously, that's super simplified. Uh, right. I was curious if it was like an earth condition thing or if, you know, it, like you said, some other species went extinct that were competing with them. Yeah, just something to, uh, to kind of chew on here. But we can uh, move on. You were talking about sharks. Yeah, they're just kind of doing their regular shark thing. If I had to guess, I would be just general, like, uh, highly productive, like... Um, like uh, like photosynthetic algae, things like that. Um, like photosynthetic single-celled organisms doing pretty well at this point in the oceans, which means that like small fish have a lot to eat, which means there's a lot of them, which means bigger fish have a lot to eat. When you have a lot to eat, you tend to be living your best life. <laughs> that makes, so, yeah, can't confirm. Um, most arthropod groups, uh, you know, most like insect groups sort of appear around this time. And there is a bit of... Uh, an extinction at the end of the Jurassic, but not anything super crazy. It's really complex and not super well understood because like some groups like really, really increase in diversity and then others decrease pretty considerably. And we don't really know why. Hmm. So a little bit of just like an unsatisfactory ending (laughs) for the Jurassic, but that takes us to the Cretaceous, which we will pick up at some point in the future. The Cretaceous is where we will pick it off. So we will did not quite get to 600 million years in 60 minutes, but the good news is that means that we've got another full hour of podcasting coming to you with about another eh, 150 or so million years, which is where all the good stuff is coming. So thank you, Gavin, for putting together. At some point, we might have to share the notes you made for this episode because it is no joke. What did we say? Six or seven pages long? <laughs> yeah, total about about seven pages. Uh, most of the notes that we have just for context are like a third of a page. And uh, Gavin Gavin really did go all out <laughs> for this episode, which uh, I thank him for. I know that all of our listeners are quite appreciative of that. So this has been episode eight of I Wish You Were Dead, a podcast about things that used to be alive. 600 million years in 60 in uh, 60 minutes. I'm probably going to put like uh, some question marks and exclamation points at the end of that for some clickbait. Of course, you got to get the clickbait. Absolutely. So to everybody that fell for our clickbait, uh, I don't apologize for a damn thing. <laughs> but I do want to welcome you to join us next time and to please subscribe to our podcast. Gavin, thank you very much. And we will see all of you next week. Absolutely.